Uh, it's really glad to see so many people in the room. So by the way, during the talk, if you have any question you want to ask, you always raise your hand. Uh, OK, so let's get started. So, my name is Yang Tang, and I'm a maintainer of coding as project. In this talk, this talk is really about the introduction to CoreDNS. I'm just wondering how many of you have already used CoreDNS before? Okay, only a few. How many of you have ever heard of CoreDNS before? <laughs> no, not, not so many. Oh, that's OK. I guess everyone probably already heard of Kubernetes. So my first thing I want to say is uh, uh, CoreDNS. Uh, at the moment, is a service discovery tool for Kubernetes. It's not solely for Kubernetes, but it is part of the Kubernetes release since 1.11. So our goal, the project goal, is to get to default in 1.13. So I guess once Kubernetes release 1.13 or maybe 1.14, the Core DNS will be part, will be the default uh, DNS server, and then I hope everyone will use Core DNS from there. Okay. Okay, so here's the agenda for today's talk. First of all, I'm going to introduce the background of Core DNS. And then we are going to share some of the status update and the future roadmaps. Uh, after that, we are going to focus on service discovery because service discovery is a main feature of Core DNS. And also the feature that distinguish Core DNS with other DNS servers. Finally, I'm going to show some of the core and the plugin examples so you can get an idea of how Core DNS works and how it could be played in Kubernetes. Okay, first, Core DNS. Core DNS is a very flexible DNS server written in Go. The, the very special case for Core DNS is that it's actually a plugin based architecture. So every functionality takes one plugin. That allows you to easily extend Core DNS functionalities with new customized plugins or anything you want to implement as long as you know how to write in Go. Core DNS supports traditional DNS functionalities like DNS, DNS over TOS. It also supports DNS over gRPC. Uh, one thing I would like to point out is that DNS over gRPC is not a DNS standard. So it's only a customer, customized implementation of Core DNS but it helps a lot in a cloud-native environment. Core DNS started a lead by Mick Jibben. The project started around the, the time frame of 2016, and in 2017, we entered into CNCF as an inception-level project. And this year, we reached to the incubating-level project. One nice thing about Core DNS is it's actually started as a fork of Caddy HTTP server. I'm not sure if anyone ever heard of CAD ATP. Oh, that's a surprise. <laughs> CAD is actually a plugin based ATP server. Uh, it's actually focusing on ATP too. So, like I said, Core DNS is a plugin based, has a plugin based architecture that shares the same architecture as CAD. When Mick started uh, uh, Core DNS, he initially just uh, grabbed the code from CAD and make a fork and then make some changes and somehow make it work in DNS. So that's kind of amazing if you think in Golang, you can just reuse a lot of code that's seemingly unrelated. Uh, by the way, the core DNS initially was called Caddy DNS. Even in, in the current code base, if you see some of the reference of Caddy, that's my purpose because even right now, core DNS can technically still be considered as a collection of Caddy plugins. <laughs> uh, Core DNS has a focus on service discovery. We actually support different ways of service discovery. Obviously, uh, we have native support for Kubernetes, and uh, that support has been in GA since 1.11. That means when you download a Kubernetes or deploy Kubernetes, uh, Core DNS binary is already there. Uh, it's not in default yet, but like I said, we are looking for pushing Core DNS into the default. So in the future, potentially, you could just deploy Kubernetes and use Core DNS automatically. 
in addition to Kubernetes support, another uh, area Core DNS focuses on is the cloud vendor integration. As, as, as we all know, when we talk about cloud native, a lot of time we are referring to public cloud. So it's very important for any DNS server to support cloud native, support cloud vendors. At the moment, we support uh, RAW 53, that's AWS DNS system. We do have plans to expand that into other cloud vendors, but that's actually, there's some reasons we haven't done so. That's mostly because of one, the resource reason. We need to have to be able to access a cloud vendor first. And the two, we need to have the documentation to be able to implement that, but contribution is welcome in this area. We also have the integration with CCD. This is actually, you can consider that as a replacement of SkyDNS. SkyDNS is also a DNS server with a, with a focus on service discovery. That's one of the mixed original project, but then we incorporate the SkyDNS as part of the core DNS. Other than for service discovery, we have some other integrations with the cloud native ecosystem. For example, we have Prometheus support so that you could use that for metrics. We also have uh, DNS functionalities. Now all the DNS functionality has been supported by core DNS because DNS is a very, very big uh, conglomerate of all kinds of RPCs, but we do have support for basic DNS functionality as well as uh, to allow you to forward or proxy to a recursive name server. So now let's get to the core DNS status, especially about the status updates since 2018. Uh, first of all, we released 1.2.6 just uh, a couple, one week ago. Uh, inside the CNCF, as I mentioned, we are at the incubating, oh, at the incubating level, but we are looking for graduation very soon, hopefully in the next several months. We also have very healthy and growing community. We have 112 contributors. Big thank for anyone contributes that. Uh, also, we have 16 maintainers. That's a very big number and a healthy number to allow the pull requests can be processed in a timely fashion. Uh, we also have 29 public adopters. Uh, by by, mean, by referring to public adopter, that only means an adopter if they are willing to share name with us and the share name with the public say they use CoreDNS in their production environment. Uh, of course, I'm pretty sure there are a lot more adopters at the moment, but if people want to say they, they use CoreDNS but they feel like it's not, uh, it's not good for them to express their names, we respect their choice. Also, we have uh, 2,800 start at the moment. So one thing I would like to say is, if you like CoreDNS, <laughs> if you have a chance, maybe you can just click Star in CoreDNS GitHub repo. In 2018, another big event for CoreDNS is that we participated in Google Summer of Code again. This year, the CoreDNS participation is from Jia Cheng Xu. He is a student from EPFL in Switzerland. He implemented a distributed server setup with core DNS that uses ETCD as a backend, but it allows you to actually identify yourself in a, in a cluster without knowing the IP address. So this is the second year in a row of core DNS to participate in Google Summer Code. The Google Summer Code is an event by, hold by sponsored by Google to essentially allow students to participate in uh, to participate in open source implementation. So if you are open, if you are a student, you want to get some you know, some stipend or get some money during the summer, you can certainly uh, spend time working on some project like Core DNS and then get something in return and also potentially uh, contribute to the open source community. So of course, that's the second year in a row. So hopefully next year, we can see some more students participating in CoreDNS as well. 
in 2018, we have some other update. First of all, each plugin is now backed by a number of owners. So that allows the pull request to be processed very easily. That also allows every maintainer to carry a lot of uh, responsibility. We have a new plugin called Loop, which allows, uh, which helps for DNS loop detection. Uh, one big area is the uh, update in Kubernetes plugin. We GA in Kubernetes 1.11. We are looking for 1.12 for default, but there are some uh, missteps and also there are some regressions in the increased memory usage. So that default was pushed back. So we make some improvement. We increase, now we increase speed and decrease the memory usage. Uh, so hopefully we get to the default in Kubernetes 1.13. It's very important for us to get to default because with, uh, if, if CoreDNS becomes a default DNS server in Kubernetes, I'm pretty sure we'll get a lot more adoptions than probably 29 public adopters. Uh, another thing happened in 2018 was that we participated in uh, security review by a company from Germany, that's the Q53. Uh, the security review was sponsored by CNCF, and also this is the first project in CNCF for security review. Uh, the name Q53, it has a 53, which seems to be a lucky number for DNS, but that's, uh, I guess that's more like a coincidence. Uh, Q53 is not a, just a security company for DNS, it's actually a generic security company. They also participate in uh, security reviews for other projects as well. At the moment, there are some, some other projects in CNCF uh, has ongoing security reviews. During the security review, Q53 found several issues. One is the cache spoofing, which has been fixed in 1.1.1. Uh, they also find two other minor bugs, which has been fixed uh, very quickly. One comment by Q53 during the security review was that they realize uh, coding as is actually written in Go, and it's actually pretty safe from the buffer overflow point of view. So they immediately switch to other security reviews. This is uh, in sharp comparison with some other DNS servers. I mean, a lot of people probably know some of DNS servers like Bind or DNS Mask Kill. They're either written in C or C++. And unfortunately, it's very hard to maintain a very good quality control in C and C++. And they typically have lots of loop, uh, lots of security vulnerabilities like buffer overflow. That, that was not the case for core DNS. Also, that's, uh, you know, we mentioned about uh, uh, core DNS to participate in Kubernetes and uh, become a default DNS server. We actually discussed with uh, Red Hat and uh, when some of Red Hat's folks, they actually notice that they actually would like to coordinate to replace DNS mask as soon as possible because they are not very feeling comfortable with DNS mask because it's written C. So for the roadmap, uh, in core DNS, the core is relatively stable and uh, we don't expect any major enhancement. Uh, in plugin side, we have several roadmaps. One for Kubernetes, obviously we are pushing for default version, that's 1.13. For log uh, plugin, we, we are looking for adding additional features and enhancement. One of them is uh, metadata. Uh, cache, that has, cache plugin, we have uh, continuous performance improvement in this plugin for a long time and we will continue. For Resolver, that's actually kind of an interesting issue because we actually receive a lot of interest asking CoreDNS to provide the Resolve functionality. Uh, there are some external interests and we are trying to come up with a plan to decide if we are going to collaborate with other open source contributors or we are going to write our own. For Cloud Integration, as I mentioned, we have uh, Raw 53 AWS DNS support. Uh, the reason we support AWS uh, uh, Raw 53 is mostly because uh, that's probably very well documented and we have access to AWS. 
But if any cloud vendor want to add support via, or want us to add support, we are certainly, uh, we are certainly welcome this approach and we will help with that. But certainly we need access to a public cloud. We also need some real documented uh, things to, for us to work on. Again, contribution will come. Finally, that's a since of graduation. We are looking for graduate pretty soon. Uh, that's, uh, we hope to, to graduate uh, uh, along with several other projects in this batch. So let's see what will happen. Uh, we talk about the contribution to core DNS. So there are several things you can do to help core DNS if you feel like it's helpful, it's useful. First, you can start core DNS in GitHub. We only have uh, 2,800 2, stars, but certainly the more the better. Uh, another thing is uh, we would like to expand the adopters.md. Like I mentioned, uh, as far as we know, there are a lot of users. They already use core DNS in their production setup, but they feel like they, it's not the right time or because of the corporate policy, they don't want to share name. You restrict their choice. But if it happens that you use core DNS in your production setup and uh, your company or your organization is not a, uh, 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 is in supportive of you to uh, share the name in core DNS uh, adopters.md, you can certainly do that. You can just open the PR, which actually helps you to become a contributor. Another thing I would like to say is uh, after you become a contributor, you can even think about becoming a maintainer. In core DNS organization, mm -hmm. the, it's pretty flat infrastructure, uh, pretty flat uh, structure. Uh, Make is a project lead, but we have 16 <coughs> maintainers total, and each maintainer share a lot of responsibilities. As a maintainer, you actually have a lot of the you actually could just recruit other maintainers. Uh, you also could add additional subject, and that does not require a big approval or like a majority. So for core DNS for us, the criteria to become a maintainer is very simple. One, you need to complete a significant pull request. By definition, a significant pull request, uh, if you only fix a typo or something, that's probably doesn't count, but if you can provide some enough technical merit, and if you, if the, another maintainer, a current maintainer feels like that you're, you could be helpful in the future pull request reviews, you will be, uh, uh, they could just, uh, another maintainer could just invite you, and you will, you, you will be uh, accepted as a maintainer. So being a maintainer of core DNS, actually, it's like a nice badge that gives you some fame. I mean, whether or not you like it, but it, it is something that I think it's, uh, it's very worth to, to think about that. Uh, okay. Now we are going to talk about the core DNS and service discovery. Uh, a lot of people actually ask me for the past year or so. Uh, nowadays, we have SDN. And nowadays, everything is so virtual. You have virtual machines on the cloud, you can define a virtual IP. You have a virtual private cloud, which is VPC. So what's the purpose of having DNS? I mean, if you can just use IP. I mean, some people may say, the, if you use IP, it may not be easy to memorize, but that's not necessarily true if everything is machine generated, right? I think there are several things to make DNS a very nice thing. A uh, nice addition to service discovery. One, DNS give you indirection. So instead of uh, talking to IP directly, you actually have an additional layer of indirection, which give you maximum flexibility. You never know what's going to happen in the future. You might change your you know, infrastructure, you might point to another subnet, or you might point to another uh, cloud. A lot of things could happen in the future. So such a flexibility could pr uh, protect you from making disruptive change in your infrastructure. Another thing is, uh, it's always easy and simple to change DNS, especially in core DNS. If you just, uh, 
I'll show in the core file how to add a record in DNS, which is just as simple as like one line. Also, DNS is very pervasive in IT infrastructure. That means uh, you don't need to build up uh, additional infrastructure just for service discovery. This is a very good thing. A lot of time, people talk about uh, all kinds of uh, things, like uh, people talking about uh, uh, monitoring, talking about logging. But people probably forgot about in a distributed environment, any component could fail. So which means uh, if you're going to monitoring, people are going to say, OK, who is going to monitor the monitor? Right? But in DNS, it's actually uh, all over the place. And you don't need to add additional component. Another thing in DNS is distributed in nature. So that actually helps you to scale your system nicely. It's not a very sophisticated or very elegant distributed system like a rapid protocol, but it's still distributed. So that's something you want to keep in mind when you design a system. So now we are going to talk about the core files. So core DNS configuration is done by core files. Actually, the core file is like a it's very similar to Caddy, Caddy's uh, file. That's, like I said, uh, for DNS was a fork of Caddy HTTP. So in this core file, as you could see, it's very straightforward. By default, all the plugins are disabled. Unless it's enabled explicitly, uh, it's not going to be in use. So the first thing is you, you can see in this core file, you have several things. First, you have service discovery from Kubernetes, for Kubernetes. It's just like a, a couple of lines. And now you say if you have a cloud, you want to have cloud integration, you could enable RAW 53 so that the data between your service discovery and the AWS cloud data sync up can happen. And then if you say, I have a couple of DNS records I want to add. I don't want to add those two or three DNS records in uh, like a, Know, some sophisticated things like in Kubernetes, like in RAW 53, or even in, some, uh, uh, in your DNS server, you can just use that. Use the host plugin to add record inline. The host plugin is just like a slash etc slash host on your local system. So it's all over the place. It just adds IP address plus a domain name, and that's all you need. It's very straightforward and simple, but we do encounter some use cases where people just say they feel like it's more, uh, more convenient to use a host plugin than some, you know, some bind functionalities like a zone file. Uh, one example we encountered was uh, one user actually added a host plugin with like 80,000 record, which is a very no, not very normal if you think about your local machine has like 8,000 records in one file. But that happens and that seems to be working okay. They're, they encounter some issues initially, uh, but looks to be okay. Uh, in addition to that, as you can see in the core file, you also have some other plugins enabled, like the health check, like a Prometheus for metrics, and also like the cache, which can help, your, help improve the performance. And finally, the forward is to forward DNS query to a DNS resolver. So in this case, we forward to 1.1.1.1. Uh, I mean, I, certainly I'm not uh, associated with Cloudflare, and I have no intention to help driving Cloudflare's business. But 1.1.1.1 is a DNS server of, by, provided by Cloudflare. They claim that's uh, Secure and the privacy. So, which means if you have some website or domain you don't want your ISPs to know, you can use this one. They will now save the record and save the data so no one knows what you have done. <laughs> um, okay, so we, we showed one core file here, right? So, one thing to, to look into that is what exactly this core file is doing. So, this core file actually uh, deploy the core DNS into a Kubernetes plugin. Now from outside, you see they sync up with different sources, like uh, Cloudflare, like uh, a couple of DNS records in etc host file, and also like uh, AWS RAW 53. So that's uh, service discovery we talk about, because when you talk about service discovery, 
you never just talk about service discovery in one uh, in one system where it's purely uh, Kubernetes because you always need to sync up with outside the world. Uh, even if you deploy a pure Kubernetes system, you may want to have something uh, from outside, not controlled by Kubernetes <coughs> containers. So that's a nice uh, example. Now people may ask, you deploy core DNS in Kubernetes, can you deploy core DNS outside? Of course you could. So when, when core DNS talk to Kubernetes, they only need to talk to API servers. So as in this case, it doesn't matter if the core DNS is inside the cluster or outside the cluster. The core DNS could be outside the cluster. It could also be deployed on every virtual machine of your choice, as long as your core DNS can talk to API servers. In this setup, you could see actually the Kubernetes cluster you can point to multiple endpoints. So in case you want to have a HA for your Kubernetes cluster, you certainly have a multiple API servers. Now, Core DNS can talk to all three and uh, find the, the healthy one so that in case one node is down, uh, they can all automatically switch to another one. Now, actually, uh, there are some enhancements from Core DNS to solve the so called HA problems. As far as I know, uh, in Kubernetes, the, uh, the API servers have some issues such that uh, it's not necessarily going to be, if you provide three, it's not necessarily going to be pointed to uh, the second or third one by default. So in our implementation in Kubernetes plugin of Core DNS, we actually just set a local proxy. So Core DNS will talk to a local proc uh, talk to itself in a local host, a local port, and the local port will further uh, proxy to multiple endpoints. So it's kind of like a we add a proxy for Kubernetes. Uh, okay, so this is uh, pretty much for a core file. Now the final thing I want to discuss is about uh, serve DNS. This is a core DNS plugin function you want to implement if you have some functionality that you cannot be achieved by enable a core file. So as you can see, the function is very straightforward and simple. You, you take an input of a DNS query message, you have the DNS response writer. Inside the function, you need to check the queue name. If the queue name match your expected record, you can just uh, go ahead and uh, do, some, do some operations by yourself. And if it doesn't match your record, you can just uh, return like the, the bottom line. In this case, the, the process will fall through to the next plugin, and they will pick up and uh, continue processing. So I think that's pretty much it from today's uh, talk. Uh, tomorrow we have a, a deep dive session. In the deep dive session, I'll walk through uh, an implementation of uh, uh, plugin, uh, of Core DNS plugin. So that uh, can give you a chance to see how everything is implemented. Uh, okay, so any, any questions? Can you show the, the microphone? Yeah. Uh, my question is, where the core DNS will do the health check for the uh, backend service, for other service? Uh, that's actually the, the core DNS health check. It's actually checking the health of the core DNS itself. But if you say you want to expose the uh, backend service, it's actually getting the data from the Kubernetes. So it's actually monitored by Kubernetes. So it's only a service discovery. OK, thank you. Uh, Microphone. 
Okay, to rephrase the question, I think the question was that the plug-in autopass, uh, if the number of pods in Kubernetes is continue increasing, the memory will increase and uh, dramatically. So that's the question, right? Uh, I can only say I'm not so familiar <laughs> with autopass in this part, but I think one thing is if we can open a, a GitHub issue, so we can take a further look. Yeah, just uh, if you know the core DNS uh, GitHub repo, uh, I think uh, it's going to be a better place to discuss that. But I'll follow up on that, and if, uh, if anything I could help, I'll, I'll make sure I can, I can help in this case. OK, thank you. OK.那个在那个 Okay, the, I think the question is, if you deploy core DNS outside of Kubernetes cluster, uh, what will happen if the IP is not routable from outside? I think that's the question, right? Yes, yes, because, uh, look, because IP in dock is not the real IP in out, outside the KBS. So core DNS, if out of, out, outside the KBS, it will want to the dock is the real IP, not the virtual IP. Uh, that's actually an interesting question. Although I would say, by default, if you deploy Kubernetes, most of the internal IP may not be exposed. You, you actually could enable that by some networking configuration. Uh, actually, like, there's nothing to prevent you to do that. For example, like in CNI implementation, uh, you can certainly expose the internal IP as well, as long as they're not overlapping the IP address space. For example, just give example, let's say in the Kubernetes cluster, uh, your Kubernetes cluster's pods are actually allocated in IP address space of 172 or something. And uh, outside, you have some other IP address space. As long as they are not overlapping, you could make that happen so that in, inside and outside can talk to each other. Of course, some secure policy uh, could be in place, but it's actually, uh, I, I showed the out, out of class deployment, let's just say you have lots of freedom, not just a way by default. 那个还有一个问题，就是说，因为Core Sorry, not sure about your so you say expire, if the application is not in the past, it can be found that many applications can't use the IP. Because in the core DNS, the IP and the domain name are already changed. But when you are in the past, 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 it will not be found in the past. When you are in the past, it will not be found in the past. When you are in the past, it will not be found in the past. It will not be found. Okay, that's an interesting question because uh, DNS is a, is a standard that has been there for decades or many decades, so it has some fundamental you know, designs that may not necessarily reflect uh, today's uh, application, so that essentially is just how DNS works. <laughs> 
，问题是说有没有那种 K8S 把 DNS 作为一个 plugin， 然后每个 Dock 起来的时候，它有一个 DNS filter 的 plugin， 这样的话就是在 call DNS 切换的时候，那个就像我们现在用的很多的那个 config server 一样，它可以感知到 DNS 和 IP 之间的切换，更新更新本地的那个 DNS filter 的。啊。这样的话，在 K8S 里面的话，它有一个 fill， 它每个 dock 呃每个 port 起来的时候，应该是有一个 plugin。This plugin can exchange the IP when call DNS is have have found this IP is not available. So this can also be I can in a train high available. It's also can be better. Ah.、Uh. Uh, I'm still trying to digest, but I think it potentially could be an interesting idea.、Uh, not sure if I can give you a definitive answer at the moment, but I would say it's probably better to open a GitHub issue in in coding as repo and see if we can in spur any further discussions. I think that's probably going to be very productive. But we definitely encourage any contributions、uh, by open a GitHub repo. Uh, uh, by open the issue, open a pull request. All the contribution are welcome. If you have some ideas, let us know so we can take a look. And if、uh, we see that reasonable and can help implement, we will try to do that. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other question? Oh, one more question. <laughs> <音>好的，这个问题很很小、哦，我想问一下，是说我之前了解到过 ，DNS 好像会有计划说出一个动态的接口，可以在运行时修改那个 DNS 记录，有这个支持吗？啊、uh, ，就是我们想在 runtime 的时候，可能突然想加一条或者删一条或者改一条那个记录，对 ，runtime 的时候，啊，就 actually the discussion has been going on for quite some time。Going on，、uh, yes， it's ongoing。有有 roadmap， 就进 roadmap 或者什么时候提供吗？啊、uh,。Well, if you can add your comment in GitHub issue, so I think that certainly can add additional weight、uh, okay, to our discussion. Okay, actually, we, 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 That's a very strong argument to far to push forward for dynamic update. So if you can provide your use case. And、uh, maybe yeah, maybe just、uh, share your experience and share your use case. I okay, okay, I will communicate with you、uh, offline. Okay. okay, okay. Thank you, thank you. Sorry about late, but okay. Thanks everyone. Yeah, we'll have a deep dive、uh, session tomorrow. So if you're interested, you can continue that. So that hopefully can give you a, a better experience on how to write a core DNS plugin and potentially become a maintainer in the future. Okay, thanks.